No, I'm not Becca Sanker. Now, Becca could not be here today. So, bear with me. We're going to go through the readings today. The Old Testament reading, Proverbs 29, verse 18, which can be found on page 611. Where there is no prophecy, the people cast off restraint, but happy are those who keep the law. The New Testament reading, Matthew 2, verses 1 to 12, which can be found on page 2 in the New Testament. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. Well, when King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. And finally, the epistle reading comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21, page 193. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Would you pray with me? Lord God, Empty me of me and fill me with you so that the words of my mouth are only yours spoken through me. And Lord, open the ears of the hearers here today that they may hear what it is you are calling on their hearts to take from your word into the world. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. 
While walking with my friend the other day, she mentioned how the year 2020 is being used in many religious circles to describe the year where God's visions will be revealed or begin being enacted. It reminded me of our stewardship campaign theme, the idea of the 2020 vision, if you may recall. Vision is important. Vision makes it easy to understand the direction and the path we take as we move forward. Vision helps us make sense of the world around us and interpret our role in it. Clear vision, like 2020, helps one see easily all the necessary details. There's also another way, though, we can understand this word vision. Visions, like those of which are revealed to us and guide us to a new understanding or a new way of living. In today's passage, we see that visions are an important life of faith. The passage from Proverbs reminds us that when we enact on those visions given to us by God, we are blessed by it. We see this to be true in the story of the Magi read today. In Matthew's Gospel, these wise men, in them we witness what it means to live into the visions given by God so that we too can be blessed by it. Now in today's passage, the wise men are actually given two different visions. First is the vision of the star that they knew by some revelation would guide them to the king of the Jews. These wise men had been studying. They knew their history. They searched all the sacred texts. And this resulted in their readiness and willingness to recognize and follow the sign when it appeared. However, they also kept themselves open to new visions that they could faithfully respond to. In their second vision, they are told to take another way home so as not to return to Herod. So in other words, their first vision led them to Christ. And after having found Christ, their second vision led them down a new path. In order to live into their visions, though, these wise men had to sacrifice their time, their comfort, their own ideologies. I believe the wise men and many other characters in the Bible are a great display of what it means to live into visions that are given to us by God. Now, if you've been here for a while, you may recall that this church went through a period of discernment that resulted in revealing a new vision. You may recall me saying that it is this church's vision statement as one of the reasons why I felt called to this church. This church's vision statement is very powerful if lived into. Now, if you don't know the vision statement or are only vaguely familiar with it, I suggest you get a copy as soon as you can. Because in order to live into the church's vision, you must first know what it is. But for those of you who aren't familiar with it, don't worry, there is time. But for today and for this sermon, I want to just go through our vision statement and see how we, like the wise men, have been given a vision that we are called to live into. So first, I want to note that in our vision statement is a sentence that is repeated three times. Now, usually when something is repetitive, it is because it is an important part of what is being expressed. This rings true for the vision statement's sentence that is repeated. And it goes like this. With God's amazing grace and the Holy Spirit present with us, we, the congregation of the East Stroudsburg Presbyterian Church, are becoming a transformed people by God's love through Jesus. In this, we see that we are continually leaving ourselves open to reforming to God's love through Jesus. If you recall, the wise men also left themselves open to new visions, to new ways of reforming themselves. For if they hadn't, we don't know how this story might have played out. 
The wise men knew the importance of continually seeking God's new ways of doing things. This is why this sentence is important to remember, and it is repeated three times. For without being open to God's new ways, we will get stuck in the past and fail to live into what is revealed in the rest of our vision statement. Now what is revealed in the most of the rest of the vision statement is a call to action. In our vision statement, we directly say that we are called to bear witness to God's love in our words and actions. We strive to welcome, recognize, and seek out all as children of God. Furthermore, we commit our hearts, time, our very talents to our church's mission. We strive to share and give thanks for our bountiful gifts. We seek to reflect God's love by first loving ourselves as God loves us, thus enabling us to love all others. And finally, we take action when it says, we strive to be humble servants of God. Through our continual service, we seek to become the voice and hands of God in our community and in our world. There's a great focus on actions. Because without actions, we cannot live in the desire of ours to be the voice and hands here and in the world. Ultimately, all visions are useless if they're not acted upon. So what might actions that live into our vision look like for us? Well, first, let me congratulate you all. Because I had given you a challenge, and that challenge was met. And that is an example of this church living into its vision. I challenged us a few months ago to match our pledge giving to $140,000, which was the last time in 2005. And the total pledge giving, I am grateful to announce, came in at $144,632. I challenged this congregation, and you responded in a way that shows spiritual maturity and an eagerness to transition into a more missional church, one that is truly living into their vision. Now, we just have to take one more step forward towards even more spiritual maturity. In this vision statement, and in many visions, God is calling us to actions that mean stepping outside of our comfort zones. By that I mean to take the next step. We will likely have to do things we aren't accustomed to do, or know how to do. But in order to be God's voice and hands, we must have a willing spirit of service. The wise men didn't know where the star would lead them for sure. It could have led them down a dangerous place, but they stepped out in faith. This congregation is really good at welcoming new people in worship, and for that I am eternally grateful. Yet these days, it's not that easy to just get people to walk through the doors. So to live into our vision, we need to invite people in as well as go to them where they are. To follow our vision, we need to be willing to come to activities that aren't really our thing. Think about it. When you're trying to build a new relationship with someone, there has to be a little bit of give and take and be prepared to do both. You will sometimes have to do things that are uncomfortable to you in order to build that initial trust and hopefully continue to strengthen the bonds between all of God's children, no matter their age, race, political affiliation, or other divisive category. Our vision statement reminds us of one final thing, that these actions are for a shared purpose of discipleship. Ultimately, though, our vision statement reminds us that through our words and actions, we are joyfully striving to become that beacon set upon a hill that Jesus instructed us to be and so glorify God. So as you can, with 2020 Clarity C, living into our vision means being like the wise men who are not only given a vision, but they also leave themselves open to new ones. 
It means being like the wise men who are given a vision and act on it despite what it means to their comfort, time, or personal ideologies. It means that to be the beacon on the hill, we must be like the star that shined the way to Christ. May we view 2020 as the time to focus on living into our vision so as to glorify God and be blessed by it. Hallelujah. Amen.